Coming up on today's episode of Airborne, the Australian Civil Aviation Safety Agency warns of Jabiru engine failures, world's second civilian Harrier is acquired, and Orion spacecraft arrives at Launch Pad 37. Welcome to Airborne on Aero TV. I'm Ashley Hale. The Australian Civil Aviation Safety Authority has just issued a consultation draft of the operating limitations to be placed on aircraft fitted with engines manufactured by Jabiru Aircraft. CASA is responding to a high and increasing rate of engine failures among aircraft that are powered by engines manufactured by or under license from Jabiru Aircraft. They're proposing the following limitations be placed on Jabiru powered aircraft. Flights will be limited to day VFR flight only. Jabiru powered aircraft must be operated in a manner that minimizes the risk of a forced landing into a populous area. No passengers may be carried and no student solo flying will be permitted. The Jabiru engine is popular in many aircraft including wide use in the U.S. and LSAs and home-built planes. CASA will consider all comments from Australian operators received as part of this consultation process when determining the final terms of the document. Comments must be forwarded by the close of business on Thursday, November 20th. Former U.S. Marine test pilot Art Knowles, who's been the only civilian pilot and owner of a BAE Harrier, has announced the acquisition of a second Harrier. It's a rare two-place T-Mark 8 that will be used for flight training and air shows when it becomes airworthy in about a year. While this latest acquisition doubles the number of civilian Harriers in the world, it's also a very rare bird. Only 46 two-place Harrier trainers were built. Knowles intends to use it for transitioning pilots to a civilian Harrier. Knowles and retired U.S. Marine Corps Major General Joe Anderson are the only two current civilian Harrier pilots. Both are certificated flight instructors and powered lift, and many other pilots could obtain a Harrier-type rating by virtue of their military training and experience. In fact, Knowles said the next civilian pilot Harrier-type rating will be issued very soon to Lieutenant Colonel Jenna Dolan, U.S. Marine Corps Reserves. Dolan has nearly 1,000 hours of Harrier flight time, combat experience, and was a weapons and tactic instructor. After the break, NASA's Orion spacecraft is on the launch pad. ADS-V will be mandatory for most aircraft by 2020 in the United States, but you can benefit from ADS-V today with the Bendix King KT-74 Mode S Transponder. The KT-74 meets the global mandates for ADS-B out when attached to a suitable WASP GPS. Finally, the extraordinary story of the world-changing XPRIZE space competition is being told and illustrated with hundreds of insider photos in Jim Campbell's colorful new book, Beyond the Blue. Journey with Jim as he flies formation with spaceships, plays in zero gravity, prepares rocket racers, and documents the amazing first decade of the personal space race. Available this summer. Get your advance order in now by checking out www.kindredspirit.com. Welcome back. If you'd like to be a supporter of Airborne, Aero TV, our website, or our podcast, drop an email to jim at aero-news.net. NASA's new Orion spacecraft is now at Launch Pad 37, sitting atop the United Launch Alliance Delta IV heavy rocket in preparation for its first trip to space on December 4th. Orion will travel almost 60,000 miles into space during an uncrewed flight designed to test many of the spacecraft systems before it begins carrying astronauts on missions to deep space destinations. The spacecraft, which includes the crew and service modules and launch abort system, will travel 3,600 miles beyond Earth. From this distance, Orion will return through Earth's atmosphere at speeds approaching 20,000 miles per hour, generating temperatures near 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit on its heat shield. The flight will allow engineers to test systems critical to safety, including the heat shield, parachutes, avionics, and attitude control. 
The two orbit flight test is expected to last four and a half hours. Each week we share with you a sample of an online video one of our viewers found especially entertaining. We call it our Aero Video of the Week. This week's exciting video takes a look at the FK-12 Sport biplane, being tested with the new UL-powered 350i engine installed. This is a lot more than might be expected during a test flight. Search FK-12 Comet Monster Flight Test on YouTube. Last Wednesday, the European Space Agency's Rosetta mission successfully landed the Philae lander on the surface of Comet 67P, but not without some challenges, partially due to anchoring harpoons not firing and the comet's low gravity Philae bounced off the surface and flew up to about six-tenths of a mile, both above the comet's surface, as well as downrange. Almost two hours after first contact, Philae touched down again. A second, more modest bounce resulted, again sending it airborne. Philae's third contact with the comet was the charm. Rosetta mission controllers believe Philae landed in a hole or crevice about six feet in diameter and six feet deep and that it's lying on its side. While the lander is still unanchored to the surface, it remains stable, and eight of its ten instruments have already begun sending back data. It's also determined that the lander is at the base of a cliff and only able to receive a limited amount of light. The Philae lander has gone into hibernation to conserve power, and mission scientists are working on a solution to improve or cope with the situation. After these messages, NetJet and the Teamsters are not playing well together. Stay tuned. Redbird Flight Simulations is dedicated to revolutionizing flight training by designing, manufacturing, and delivering affordable and innovative flight training technologies. Each Redbird device is designed to enhance the training experience for pilots of all levels, from student to ATP. Redbird is quickly becoming the industry standard for flight training. Since Redbird introduced its revolutionary FMX in 2007, colleges, universities, and flight training operations around the world have integrated Redbird products into their curriculum. It's time to discover what Redbird can do for you. Join the migration. Welcome back. The latest round of negotiations between NetJets and the International Brotherhood of Teamsters involved a threat by the union to release the names of some of the fractional company's high net worth customers, and the company is saying it will fire workers if they do so. There are about 600 workers at NetJet represented by the Teamsters, including flight attendants, mechanics, and other ground personnel. In a news release, the union says, quote, NetJet's threat to terminate middle-class workers is just the latest example of this out-of-control multinational corporation trying to coerce and intimidate its workforce into subsidizing the global super-rich, end quote. NetJet released a statement that said in part, quote, Notwithstanding the union's rhetoric, NetJet has the utmost respect for the professionalism of its pilots, but we believe progress and collective bargaining can be made only at the bargaining table, and we share our team members' frustration with a lack of progress that has resulted from the union's failure to negotiate in a responsible and meaningful way." End quote. Transport Canada has announced two exemptions that simplify small unmanned air vehicle operations and safely integrate UAVs into Canadian airspace. Under the new exemptions, a special flight operations certificate will not be required for UAVs under approximately 4.4 pounds, and certain operations, including UAVs, under approximately 55 pounds. The new approach will apply to commercial operations and contribute to a strong safety regime for those on the ground and in the skies. Operators must simply check on Transport Canada's website to see if the exemptions apply to them and follow the specified operating rules. These rules include operating within visual line of sight, maximum operating altitudes, and away from built-up areas and airports. In addition, Transport Canada is simplifying the application process and reducing the time it takes to issue special flight operations certificates for larger UAV operators. Canada has had safety regulations in place that govern the use of UAVs since 1996. 
Under the new rules, operators must still apply for a special flight operations certificate for UAVs weighing more than 55 pounds. Linking the terms indoor and skydiving seems to be a bit of an oxymoron, but the first internationally recognized competition took place over the weekend at iFly Austin in Austin, Texas. Indoor skydiving involves a powerful indoor vertical wind tunnel that simulates the forces of a skydiver falling through the air. This allows a controlled way for someone to float in the air without the need to jump from a plane. In January of this year, the FAI and IPC voted to recognize wind tunnel competitions at the world level, making this the first FAI-sanctioned indoor skydiving event. Events being scored in the indoor skydiving competition include formation skydiving, vertical formation skydiving, free fly, and freestyle. Rules have been established for the competition and judges are certified. Competitors from around the world attended this event. Well, that's our program. Remember to get comprehensive real-time 24-7 coverage of the latest aviation and aerospace stories anytime at aero-news.net. Remember, Airborne is streamed three times a week and is always online. Join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for a new episode. And remember, the next generation of Airborne will be unveiled right after New Year's. I'm Ashley Hale. Thanks for watching.